In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quinarius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. Merry Christmas, Christ Church. Thank you so much for joining us for this special online version of Candlelight Christmas Eve here at Christ Church. We know it's been an interesting year for everyone. It's certainly going to be an interesting Christmas season, very different from what many of us are used to, but thank you so much for taking some time out of your schedule to join us this evening for a candlelight service here at Christ Church. We're all gathered together. We're just not all in the same place. We're together online. I hope you have a candle ready, for one for each of the people worshiping with you. We're still going to do a candle lighting. Make sure you've got a lighter and a candle uh, for each of you available for when we sing Silent Night and light the Advent candles later uh, in the service. So I hope you're ready for that. And I just want to make one reminder that we are not going to have in-person worship this weekend or online worship this weekend. We are giving our worship team our media team, all of those people who put in so much time and effort to make worship possible for us. 
We're giving them the day off as a, as a gift to them. So we'll be back together on Sunday, January 3rd, and uh, looking forward to that. It'll be a testimony service, looking back at 2020, what, we learned, what you learned about yourself, what maybe something God showed you about uh, where He's at work in your life, something He wants to do in your life. Maybe it's a sin He wants to root out of your life. Uh, but that's what we'll be, we'll be looking at and doing on the uh, third, the first uh, Sunday in, in the new year, 2021. I know we're all excited to turn the page on 2020 and get this behind us. We know there'll be some lag and some things that carry over into 2021 as well for a while. Uh, but hope you'll join us again, either in person or online, on the, the 3rd of January. And if you are watching online, you'll still be able to offer your testimony if you'd like to to send one in via email, you can email it to me at jeff, J-E-F-F, at Christ Church Traverse City, that's all one word, dot com, and I'd be happy to read it, and uh, we'll be giving you both uh, my cell phone number and one other cell phone number that you can text a, a brief testimony in if you would like to on that morning, and we'll read it uh, with your name as well. So we'll still give you the opportunity to participate in the testimony service, even if you're watching from home. Well, let's prepare our hearts to worship God right now on this Christmas Eve with a moment of silence followed by uh, the beginning of our service. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all of people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was the angel with a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. What
And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name.
Will you pray with me, please? Father in heaven, we come before you on this Christmas Eve, grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grateful that in the darkness of our lives, you come with the light of Christ, bringing hope and healing and salvation to each one of us so desperately in need of a touch from you. We pray that you would remind us as we celebrate Christmas this season of your great love for us. And we pray for those who are dealing with having to be away from family members. We pray for those who are, are dealing with uh, maybe not being able to be visited like they're used to. We pray that you would be with those who are, are dealing with loneliness in some way that during this Christmas season. We know that COVID has created a lot of loneliness and a lot of fear and a lot of despair. We pray for those who are struggling. We pray that you would be with them. Uh, bring your peace and your comforting presence. We pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Darkness can be disorienting. In a, in a completely dark room, it's easy to get turned around, isn't it? You know, I, you, you don't really know where you are in the room. I mean, we might sort of know where we are, but we still kind of bump into things. We, we catch ourselves on doorknobs or we bang our toes on the coffee table because we don't know exactly where we are in the room. Sometimes we're really not sure at all uh, where we are. Darkness can be distor- uh, disorienting. It can also be disturbing. When we're in the dark, uh, things may appear to be something that they're not, and our imaginations tend to run wild. When I was young, my parents, uh, and my parents would turn out my bedroom lights, my desk became a monster hiding in the corner, and, and my coat hanging on the hook became someone coming to get me, and the sound of the clock tick-tocking on my uh, dresser became the, uh, a witch's fingernails drumming on my dresser. You know, our imaginations run wild in the dark. Um, darkness can be disguising. Things that we don't want someone else to see are, are hidden in the darkness of a closet or corner. Um, often, you know, crime is committed under cover of darkness. It can be disguising. And darkness can also be discouraging. Ask someone who can't sleep how long the night seems to be to them. Or try to find someone or perform a task in the dark, you know, without adequate lighting. It's frustrating, isn't it? So yeah, darkness can be disorienting, it can be disturbing, it can be disguising, and it can be discouraging. But the funny thing about darkness, when you turn on the light, it dissipates. Darkness isn't something in and of itself. It's the absence of something. It's the absence of light. Well, light plays a huge role in our celebration of Christmas. In this Advent season, we've been doing a sermon series from the book of Isaiah uh, called Christmas Lights. Uh, and, and light plays the role that it does in our celebration of Christmas because in the Bible, we as human beings separated from God are pictured as living in darkness. Uh, we're pictured as living in darkness because of our sinfulness. Now, that doesn't mean we're all axe murderers or something like that, but it does mean that we all, in some ways, fall short. You know, we all mess up, right? Sometimes it's unintentional, for sure. And sometimes it is, if we're honest with ourselves, it's on purpose. We willfully do wrong sometimes. No one really contests that. We know that we all mess up. We all know that to be human is to mess up to fall short, to to want our own way, to want to do things our own way. The Bible calls that human tendency to fall short and do things our own way sin. Now, some of us are sin worse than others, but we all sin. And no matter how hard we try not to mess things up, we do mess things up. The problem is that we're really good at convincing ourselves that God doesn't really care about our mistakes. That God doesn't expect us to be perfect. Now, on one level, that's true. God doesn't expect us to be perfect because he knows we can't be perfect because of sin. But here's the thing. When we mess up, when we sin, 
we hurt ourselves, and we often hurt other people too. If God doesn't mind our mistakes, even if we meant well, but they hurt others, how can God be just and fair to the people we hurt, right? If God doesn't mind my mistakes when they hurt others, is God really just and fair? No. God doesn't turn a blind eye to our sin, and God cares about it because God cares about us. He doesn't want us to hurt ourselves, and he doesn't want us to hurt each other. And no matter how hard we try, we can't stop doing that. Now, our sin separates us from God. It creates distance between us and God, and it also separates us from one another. Has there ever been a person alive who hasn't had a strained relationship with someone, at least one person in their life, we all have strained relationships with someone. I mean, I really doubt there's ever been a person who's gotten along literally with everyone. In all of that mess, all of that darkness, all of that gunk, that sin mess, the Bible says that's darkness. The problem is we can't get out of the darkness alone. We can't solve all of our problems by ourselves. We can't drag ourselves out of the mess and clean ourselves up because everything we touch gets messy too. Someone else has to clean us up. Someone else has to turn on the light. Now, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah talked a lot about that light uh, because he was a prophet in Judah during a really, really dark time in Judah's history. The brutal Assyrian Empire was threatening to take over Judah and deport her people. And on top of that, her immediate neighbors uh, were marching on Jerusalem with plans to besiege the city and depose her king and put their own puppet king on Judah's throne in Jerusalem. But in the face of all of that pressure, you know, this world superpower who was threatening them and then their immediate neighbors who were also marching on them, um, In the face of all of that, they were refusing to cry out to God. They were refusing to turn to God for help. They insisted that they could work their own way out of this mess. They were stubborn. They were insisting on relying on their own ingenuity, their own ability to maneuver and play the chess game, you know, their own solutions to their problems. Well, through Isaiah, God reveals himself as an unparalleled, unsurpassed, mighty God. A God of infinite wisdom and power and majesties. And and as Judah's neighbors march on Jerusalem, God, through Isaiah, tells their king Ahaz, he says to Ahaz, that the world's two superpowers at the time, Egypt and Assyria, are a fly and a bumblebee who do exactly what God tells them to do and that God can squash them in a moment. He can summon them to do his work. He can dispatch them. They're nothing to him. The things that seem like a big deal to to Judah and to Judah's king Ahaz, the problems they're trying to solve are nothing to God, but they won't turn to God. Now, God says he'll deal with Egypt and he'll deal with Assyria regardless. The question is, will Judah and her king trust God or are they going to try to maneuver their way out of their darkness on their own? Well, the sad news is they were going to try to do it on their own. And their darkness would only get darker. Assyria would march on Jerusalem, eventually destroying the city and Solomon's magnificent temple, laying the land waste. That temple that was built for the worship of God was destroyed. The temple storehouse was plundered. And Judah's treasures were carried off to Assyria's capital city of Nineveh. The best people of, uh, uh, that lived in Judah, the best and brightest, so to speak, would be taken to Assyria to live there as exiles, as foreigners in a foreign land. That's what happens when we try to crawl out of the darkness on our own. The darkness only deepens. It just gets darker. Darkness can't undo darkness. Only light can do that. But even in their stubborn refusal to trust God and rely on Him, even as the people of Judah turned their back on God, God refused to turn His back on them. Now, they did wind up in exile. Their land was laid waste. There were consequences for their disobedience in this life. But in the midst of all that, God did not turn His back on them. Darkness only lasts forever if you let it. The light was coming. 
Listen to the word of God to the people of Judah through their prophet Isaiah. God himself is going to save his people, not just from oppression in Assyria and then Babylon and then Persia, but from their bigger problem, their stubborn, sinful darkness. I'm going to read Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. But there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the later time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden, and the staff for his shoulder, and the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, and to us... A son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of no end, on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Now, God is going to act to save his people. Now, they're going into exile. And for decades, they're going to be in exile. Some of these people are going to die in exile with these promises yet unfulfilled, but they are sure promises from God. God is not going to leave his people in their condition. They have to deal, they have to pay the price for their sin. They have to, they have to uh, uh, face Uh, what they've done and the sin that they've committed, but God's not going to leave them there forever. Now, I have uh, here a stick, kind of like a yoke. As human beings, we carry heavy burdens, don't we? Some of those burdens are placed there by others, abuse, Neglect, abandonment, unfaithfulness, oppression, and injustice, painful words, painful actions. You know, as human beings, we we hurt each other, we break each other, and it's like a yoke of slavery. We also add to that weight uh, our own burden through our own sin. Lying, cheating, bitterness, unforgiveness, refusing to right that which is wrong. We don't do things we oughtn't do and We do things we shouldn't. Christ came to set us free from the weight of our burdens. For the yoke of his burden, Isaiah says, and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. The Assyrians took many Jews captive, especially the northern tribes. By the time of Isaiah's prophetic ministry, Israel had already divided into two distinct nations. The northern ten tribes retained the name Israel, and they ended up moving their capital north to the city of Samaria. Their genetic line was more or less obliterated as they intermarried with the Assyrians and other peoples that the Assyrians moved into their land, and they became what was known as the Samaritans at the time of Jesus. Now, Judah's genetic line remained more intact. We get the word Jew from the name Judah, but they too were taken into captivity. You know, we get captured by various evils. We all have our signature sins. Those ways that sin expresses itself in our lives. It might be an addiction. It could be pornography. It might be a habit of lying or being unfaithful or a tendency to hurt others or with harsh words or with gossip. It could be anger. It could be greed. It could be a reliance on our, only on ourselves and our own ingenuity, an insistence on doing things our way, a refusal to bow our knee before God.
try not to hurt myself as I do that. It was easier for Jesus to break the rod than me. Remember the words of Isaiah. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. The Assyrians were a brutal people. They beat their prisoners with rods to cause shame and fear. That's what sin does. It leaves us in fear and shame. It leaves us in darkness. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. God breaks the things that bind us up. And how does God do this? How does God break these things and turn on the light, overcoming the darkness? A mighty angelic army from heaven? He has them, right? Isaiah got a glimpse into, into God's throne room and his description of the angels there, uh, worshiping God, hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of them, uh, has them seeming more like dragons than fat little cherubs. They are mighty and fearsome when they want to be. So does God invade earth with a dragon-like angelic army? No. Earthquakes and volcanoes and fire from heaven to which nuclear bat blasts pale in comparison? No. It's through a child. But this child is no ordinary child. Oh, he's fully human. He has blood and a heart and a brain and muscles and he gets tired and hungry and, and is tempted just like you and I are, but he's also fully God. You see, that's how God chooses to turn on the light and overcome the darkness, by joining us in the darkness, taking our darkness upon himself so that injustice and evil and wrong are punished. Christ took it upon himself. And then God turns on the light. And this child is our wonderful counselor. His wisdom surpasses human wisdom. And if we choose to follow him, we'll let him lead. This child is mighty God. If we choose to follow him, we do as he says, for he fights our battles for us. Now, this child is everlasting father in temporal skin he knows no limits he has no boundaries he is and he is there in the midst of the darkness with us and this child is the prince of peace he's the birthplace of peace he brings peace with god and he brings the peace of god having brought peace between us and god peace with god he makes possible peace between us and other human beings. He can heal friendships. He can heal broken families. He heals broken marriages. All insofar as the individuals involved submit to his leading and his authority. And when Christ returns, he and he alone will end war. He will judge between nations. And the peace that he brings will never end. Now, looking down at the end of verse 7, Isaiah says, With justice and with righteousness, from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. When God says he's going to do something, it's as good as done, even if it hasn't happened yet in our timeline. Even if from our perspective, it's still in the future. But you can take it to the bank. And so you can speak of it, as Isaiah does, as if it's present, as if it's already done. Such is the promise, the hope of Christmas. Such is the light of Christmas. Now this is a lot to put on the shoulders of a newborn babe, isn't it? But this babe, fully human, coming from Mary's womb, was also mighty God and everlasting Father. 
And when Christ cried out from the cross, it is finished and died, this work was completed. Some has yet to be fulfilled. But as we await Christ's return, he still goes about his work of turning on the light in people's lives, bringing his hope and healing to each one of us, to our families, our friendships, all of our broken places and broken relationships. That is the light of Christmas. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you on this Christmas Eve grateful for your turning on the light, overcoming the darkness. And Lord, I want to acknowledge right now that there might be somebody that is watching who is still living in darkness and longs for the light to be turned on in their life, longs for your healing presence. If that's you tonight, on this Christmas Eve, I want to invite you to pray a very simple prayer with me. I just want you to say, my Heavenly Father, thank you for the forgiveness of sin. I confess that you sent the Son, Jesus, to be born in Bethlehem, to grow up, to become a great teacher, and then to die on a cross for my sin. I confess that I am a sinner that I do live in darkness, but I long for you to take that burden from me and replace it with your love and your peace and your holiness and your righteousness. I know that I'll never be perfect in this life, but I want to live in this life knowing that I am forgiven by you through Jesus Christ. Thank you for saving me this Christmas Eve in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Now, if you did pray that, I want, you to, want to invite you to do one more thing, and that's to send me an email. Again, my email address is jeff at christchurchtraversecity.com. And just let me know that you did. I just want to be able to celebrate that with you. Thanks so much. At this time, I'm going to invite the Ross Kelly family to come forward and light our Advent candles. And as they're lighting the Advent candles, I want to invite you to light your own candles there in your house. Maybe dim the lights and sing with us the words to Silent Night. The season for watching and waiting is over. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. This is the light of the world, and the darkness cannot extinguish it. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all people. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, bring an offering, and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor, tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice. He will judge the world with righteousness, and the peoples with his truth.
Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the king, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Thank you once again for joining us for this online version of Candlelight Christmas Eve at Christ Church of Traverse City. We're grateful that you took the time to spend with us this evening. As you go into your Christmas season, I, wanna, I, want, I hope you'll let me to pray over you and over your Christmas celebrations with families. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for your great love for us made visible in Jesus Christ. We pray as we go forth to celebrate the birth of your Son that you would fill our hearts with joy and peace. Where there is pain and sadness, I pray that you would bring joy. Where there is darkness, I pray that you would turn on the light. May we go in peace knowing that we are loved by you. In the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, whose birth we celebrate, we pray. Amen. Go in peace.